you can see that overlooks all wildlife. Uh, our agency is broken up, you know, not not dissimilar to many other state fish and wildlife agencies or even private businesses into a number of sections uh, with each having their own specialty. Uh, we have a fishery section that oversees fisheries research and management, a wildlife section that does the same thing on the wildlife side of things, a natural heritage and endangered species program, and they uh, help to manage uh, and monitor all of our non-game and our threatened and endangered species, as well as administer our Massachusetts Endangered Species Act, which is um, probably one of the strongest in, in the country on protecting rare species and their habitats. Um, we've got an information and education section and they do all of our uh, educational programs, our outreach, our magazines, pamphlets, um, website, all of that sort of thing. And then one of the most important things and one of the most enjoyable things um, uh, that I'm a part of is part of our wildlife lands um, section or committee. So we have individuals from all of our different sections, all of our different uh, um, specialties involved in our wildlife lands committee. And, and that's a part of our agency that protects, um, permanently protects open space for the benefit of uh, the public and for wildlife. And it is one of the most important things that we do because without habitat, without the land protected, uh, wildlife and, and our habitats can't, can't survive. Our agency is funded by a number of different ways. One of the ways is uh, the sale of hunting, fishing and trapping licenses and associated permits and fees. Um, but there's also a federal excise tax that is placed on um, a bunch of different sporting equipment, not only hunting and fishing equipment, but some other um, optics, some boating uh, type equipment. And we get a, a tax back from that. Um, and that was originally put into place back in 1938 um, by sportsman conservationists who wanted uh, to, to pay into the resource and, and protect um, and be able to support conservation efforts across the country. Oh, went too far ahead. Um, I'm in the Southeast District, so I manage the Southeastern part of the state, which is Bristol, Plymouth, um, Barnesville County and the islands. Uh, the whole state's broken up into five districts. So each district has a headquarters office um, I supervise the southeast one, so we have a fisheries biologist, a wildlife biologist, a stewardship biologist, so they do um, oversee the stewardship of our lands. Four fish and wildlife technicians, and they do a lot of the field work. Um, a land agent who doesn't actually work for the district, but she works for the whole um, state under the department, and then a clerk in our office, and we're really Kind of referred to as the workhorse of the agency so we're the on the boots on the ground folks in the different regions of the state that manage the properties uh, interact with the public do the the localized regional fish and wildlife research and management and we're the ones that you're most likely to see out on any of our properties or most likely to speak to if you ever have a wildlife issue as I mentioned, um, our land acquisition program is one of the most important things that we do. And, and that program, you know, probably very similar to how the 300 committee and other um, land trusts operate, we really try and focus in on the most important and special properties in, in the state. And I think we do a very good job at doing that. And we don't only look at, you know, say rare species habitat or cold water fisheries habitat or interior forest we take all of that into consideration through a, a pretty lengthy, detailed process to make sure that we're acquiring the best properties. One of those properties, and you know, frankly, one of the, the most important and special properties in the whole state is right, right down there in Falmouth, uh, our Francis A. Crane Wildlife Management Area. And you've probably seen, if you're familiar with the property, we do um, very actively manage that property for a variety of different habitat types, pitch pine, scrub oak, barrens, but also the kind of the, the main feature of the property is the over 300 acre sampling grassland. And that supports a wide range of species, both common and a number of rare species. So <clears throat> now that you know a little bit about our agency, I'll, I'll get into the meat of the talk regarding fishers. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the biology of Fisher, uh, the history of, of the Fisher population in Massachusetts, but also this species is by far and away 
the most misunderstood, misrepresented um, species that we have in Massachusetts and really throughout New England. There's a lot of talk and rumors about fishers when in reality, um, not a lot of the stuff that people tend to say about fishers uh, uh, is true. And I'll get into that. And then I'll end the talk like I do many of the talks, talking about a few of the simple things that we can do as, as human beings to live with Fisher and not have conflicts or create situations where we're gonna have conflicts with Fisher. And the same information I'll talk about goes really for, for any other suburban wildlife species that, that you might get um, in your yards. So the first thing is by far and away, Fishers get a terrible rap. They are not going to come out of the woods and tear your children away or you know, kill everything in sight. They're not a vicious, aggressive animal unless you happen to be a squirrel or you know, a rabbit. They're actually a very elusive, shy species and they're not anywhere near as aggressive as, as people make them out to be or dangerous for that matter. <clears throat> Um, going back through history, fishers were a lot more widespread than they are today. Um, you can see here, their range has shrunk over the years, but they do still um, inhabit really the boreal forest region from New England all the way through um, across Canada and up towards Alaska. Um, they do get down uh, to the south in some portions of um, the west and in New England down into New York, West Virginia, that type of area. But their range has greatly um, been reduced over the years for a variety of reasons I'll, I'll get into. Currently in Massachusetts, fishers are found and common statewide, including on Cape Cod. And that's really happened in Cape Cod in the past um, eight to 10 years where they, they first showed up and then all of a sudden we're getting reports of them pretty much everywhere. They're getting hit on the roads. Um, people are seeing them, taking photographs of them. So they are now common on the Cape. Um, I would not be surprised at some point if they show up on or already are on some of the Elizabeth Islands and maybe even get over to um, Martha's Vineyard. To get over to Nantucket, that would be a bit more of a stretch um, and it would probably take human intervention for that type of a thing to happen. So historically, when I started learning about fishers in school, they were one of these species that were tied to big, unbroken, unfragmented tracts of closed canopy forest, um, mature closed canopy forest. And, you know, they, it was pounded into our heads that this animal, if you, you know, if you fragment the habitat or break it up in any way, it's going to drastically affect them. And that was the case for a little bit, but they're, They've proven to be one of the species, very similar to a number of our other suburban or species that you find in suburban areas that are a lot more uh, adaptable than, than we once thought or once learned. Um, they do tend to prevent, uh, prefer coniferous forests, but they will use pretty much any forested habitat type. Um, I know it says that they tend to avoid open areas, which by, by a rule they do, but they don't have any problem going across a field, um, going out into the open in a salt marsh, anything like that. If the food is there, um, they're gonna go there. Um, today, we're even finding them uh, at home in suburbia. Um, they're one of what we consider our suburban wildlife species. Whereas, you know, 20 years ago, we would never have expected them to be in that type of a habitat uh, because they were tied to um, unbroken closed canopy forest. But, as many other species have found, there's a lot of food available and <clears throat> not necessarily a lot of risk involved with, with living in and around suburban areas. So the food is there. A lot of our species have learned how to survive in suburbia. And in fact, we've even had fishers right in uh, downtown Boston. Um, of course, they're not at as high a density as they would be in other places, but they have been seen and are known to occur in downtown Boston. So a species that went from being something tied to huge forest to now being in downtown cities, it's, it's just remarkable the, the level of adapt, adapt, adaptability that they have. So um, fish are, share a pretty similar story to a number of our other wildlife species. 
um, namely ones like black bears, uh, beaver, um, and some other species where their history, it's not necessarily always a positive story, but they, they share a very similar one. And it starts back in the pre-colonial times um, with Native Americans and then runs right up through till today. And I'll go through some of the steps. I'm not gonna go get too in depth on any of it, but to give you an idea, it's, it's an important um, history lesson to know when you're talking about a lot of our wildlife species, how the habitat in Massachusetts has, has changed so dramatically uh, several times over the years and how that's, that coupled with human activity has, has affected some of these species populations. So if you go back to pre-colonial times, you know, the 1600s, um, much of Massachusetts was largely closed canopy forest. Um, it was all forested. There were some forest openings caused by natural um, weather events, fires, natural fires, also man-made fires from the Native Americans. Um, we know that <clears throat> They were pretty good land managers, and there's even some information that they might have intentionally set fires at times as part of their hunting practices or to manage habitats. Um, but you also had escaped fires from their villages. And then windstorms, hurricanes, um, things like that would create forest openings. So there, were, there was a mosaic of these early successional or open habitats, um, but set within a largely forested um, landscape and because of that animals like fisher, black bear, um, beaver, white-tailed deer, turkey were all vastly abundant um, in, in pre-colonial New England and that's supported by some of the early colonial records when they came um, and, and started to try and settle this region they often noted the vast abundance of, of game species in their early records. So we know Native Americans did utilize wildlife, um, but they also valued them very strongly, um, not only for the, the food they could provide, um, the byproducts and that they could get out of them like bones for tools, their pelts for clothing or ceremonial items, um, but they also saw them as sacred beings that they shared the planet with and gave many of the animals, um, thought them to have true spiritual powers. So um, the, the interesting thing about the Native Americans too is that they would never overutilize a wildlife species. And I'll talk about a little bit about how some people did come to overutilize species, but the Native Americans tended to um, sustainably use the species and not take all of the deer out of a given area or they'd move from area to area um, to make sure that there was always abundant game because they relied on it for their survival. They used um, species, including fisher to a degree, but I, um, everything that I've seen or heard is that fisher were typically only used in times of, of great scarcity as a food item. But they certainly used fisher for their pelts and for their bones for, and claws for ceremonial items and tools. Um, they used organs of some species, such as black bear and other ones for medicines. And then they traded parts, whether it be food or um, bones or pelts, amongst tribes to get barter for different items, and then later with the European colonists. So then starting in um, the early to mid 1700s, the, the colonies of European colonists who had arrived here and at first found it a very difficult place to live. Um, a large number of the early settlers um, that came over on the Mayflower died the very first winter. Um, but through time and actually with the help of the Native Americans, they started to learn how to survive. And um, in not too long a period of time, between about 1640 and 1740, you started probably, you had about 10,000 settlers in the region. And that population began to grow and grow. And as they spread out, they did what's shown here in this photo. They started to clear land for, um, subsistence farming and livestock and also for wood products both for burning and for building their their homesteads so slowly but surely uh, the Massachusetts landscape began to change and as they cleared more and more land there was less and less forest but also at the same time they were not utilizing wildlife in the in the wise or sustainable way um, oftentimes that the the Native Americans did 
So they were depleting these species at the same time while they're depleting their habitat. So you started to see bears, fisher, beaver start to rapidly decline throughout the region. <clears throat> and by the early to mid 1840s, most of Massachusetts landscape was open. So open farmland. Uh, so you'd taken a, a, a habitat or a, a region that was almost 100% forested habitat and now you've transformed it to almost 100% open habitat. At this point, bears, fishers, beavers, a number of other species, even deer, um, were virtually gone from the, the landscape. Um, beavers in particular, you can see that if you look at the beaver trade, which was once um, housed right on the, the coast or near the shoreline. Um, by this point, the beaver trade had moved way inland up the Connecticut and Merrimack rivers because they'd essentially depleted all of the beavers and in the eastern part of um, Massachusetts. By this time, the mid 1800s, you basically bears, turkeys, fisher, they're all essentially extirpated from, from the region. <clears throat> so then as the Industrial Revolution started to, to take place and ramp up, you saw more and more people moving um, down along the rivers and down to more urbanized or developed areas um, where manufacturing was going on and uh, farmlands and these homesteads were abandoned at a huge rate across the Massachusetts landscape. And that led to something called um, succession. So some of these fields slowly would start to succeed um, from an agricultural field to um, weedy species uh, or what people often refer to as weedy species like goldenrod um, and some of these other uh, early species that come in on this depleted landscape. And then within a few years, you have more asters and forbs and um, even some small shrubs starting to come in. And then eventually you get to more of a shrub dominated landscape in about seven years where you even have some tree seedlings and saplings coming in. And then slowly but surely, you know, all of this farmland became early successional habitat. So species like rough grouse, cottontail rabbit, woodcock, um, a number of um, game species that rely on early successional habitat they became super abundant in Massachusetts. But at the same time, you started to see forests come back. So as the forests come back, you know, by about the early 1900s, you start to have, again, a primarily forested habitat throughout much of Massachusetts. And those species that rely on forested habitat could slowly start to recover. So in about 1930, um, hardwoods, succeeded by uh, white pine, you start to get more pine forests. And then the species like Fisher and, and others really started to come back. I mean, black bears were essentially extirpated to the far rugged mountainous regions in um, Western Massachusetts. And that's because that's where the only forests still remained. Uh, the, the, the country was too rugged um, uh, for people to get in and farm and clear. So that was really the only last semblance of bears and fishers in Massachusetts. Um, they were, fisher in particular, were considered extirpated from Massachusetts. So they were considered gone completely from the state uh, in about 1840 at that, the height of that farming. And then they began to reappear um, anecdotally sometime in the 1960s. So our agency's first official records of fisher came during the, the 1971-72 trapping season, where a couple of fisher were trapped, um, incidentally, uh, in traps set for other animals in Phillipston and Ashburton, Burnham. Um, and since that time, they've slowly expanded their range throughout Massachusetts. And as I kind of alluded to earlier, the first fisher confirmed on Cape Cod was in 2005. Um, but I suspect that they were there for a few years um, before that happening. A uh, little bit about history of how Fisher have been managed um, in, our, um, in our past. The first actual trapping season for them was back in 72, 73. And then it was um, shrunk down in 1977 and then further shrunk down in 1980. And it's basically remained about um, 
you know, the month, three weeks to a month in the um, month of November since that time. To get a little bit of an idea how Fisher started to spread back out through Massachusetts, we can look at our, our Fisher harvest through our trapping season, um, which gives us a good index of, in general, where fishers are coming from, um, but not really anything too strong in terms of density or really their true distribution in the state because it really relies on where you have um, people actively um, trapping. So you can see by about 2005, we have um, much of the state, even though it doesn't show, is starting to get fisher. Certainly their stronghold is the central region, but that could also be um, a stronghold of where a lot of trappers still remain. But you start to see them showing up again in southeastern Massachusetts here. And then even more um, at this point, you start to see them spread out, even getting up into the northeastern part of the state. And we do show the Elizabeth Islands down there as having a fisher record at that point. And then a little bit more in 2014. And at this point, um, this is more tied to not necessarily the fisher population, but more where we have licensed trappers that are actively trapping. Um, at this point, we considered fishers common throughout um, all of mainland. Um, Massachusetts. So a, a lot of people refer to fishers as fisher cats. Um, you hear that all the time. They're not necessarily, they're not um, a cat. Now, I'll get into a little bit later where I think the, the cat comes from. There's, there's two possible ways. Um, fishers rarely eat fish, so it doesn't come from that. It clearly has to do with this animal here that's shown on this um, slide, and that's a, pole, a European polecat. And they're called over there, fisse or vise, which sounds similar to fisher. And then the French term for the pelt of the polecat is actually fiche, um, which that's where we believe the name officially came from. When the first European uh, colonists came over, they saw an animal that looked very similar to one that they were familiar with that they called fiche. And through time that just transitioned into Fisher. Um, Fisher cat could come from the fact that the European polecat, and again, they're not cats, and I'll get into that in a little bit. It also could come to their claws because they do have sharp, long, retractable claws, very similar to a cat's. Scientific name is uh, Picania penanti mustelidae, so they're in the weasel family. Again, not a cat. Um, it was originally Martis in the same um, genus as the, the Pine Martin, but through genetic work, they split them off as their own um, genus, Picania. Historically, there were seven members of the weasel family in Massachusetts, the, weas uh, the fisher being one. Two of those have been extirpated and um, have not returned, that being the American Martin and the Wolverine. Um, however, um, we have had some anecdotal evidence of possibly there being still some um, American Martin in Massachusetts. They have been documented in New Hampshire and Vermont, so. Excuse me. Um, but uh, we don't have an official trail camera photo or anything like that. The other two very um, remotely similar species that we have in Massachusetts that sometimes, sometimes people could mistake a fisher for the one on the left is the pine martin, so um, it would be extremely, extremely rare for anyone to see one of those. But the one on the right is the mink, and while they are much smaller than uh, fisher, they do have very similar body shape, coloration. Um, you can see them crossing the road, and people will often uh, mistake them for a fisher or a baby fisher. Um, some people say. Um, one of the things I call fishers is basically a ferret on steroids. Uh, they, if you've ever seen a ferret, gone to a pet store, somebody, your friend has had um, a pet ferret and you've seen how they, they move around and bounce around and move in that weasel way. A, a fisher is basically that same animal with that same agility level, just on steroids, just a, a much bigger, stronger, more powerful animal. They do exhibit sexual dimorphism, so that means the males and females are different in some way. Uh, in, in Fisher, it's primarily their body size, so males are uh, quite a bit larger, can get quite a bit larger, anywhere from seven to 16 pounds. 
um, total length of about three to four feet. So that's that's a, a sizable animal. Although, you know, oftentimes over a foot of that, or if not more, can be their tail. Um, but they are a big animal. And males don't reach their full adult size until they're a year old. Females reach their adult size a lot quicker at about five and a half months. Um, but they only get to be about four to six pounds, so it's it's easier for them to get to that size um, quickly. Uh, they're medium dark brown um, animals. Oftentimes they look jet black if you see them, um, particularly their legs and tail. The males in particular have tricolored um, prominent guard hair, so that, that lighter color, and I do have a, a pelt here, and you can kind of see, I don't know if you can see the, the lighter grizzled um, guard hairs on their back, and then lower down, they're gonna be that much darker on their legs and tail. Um, females do tend to have much darker coats than the males, um, and sometimes it's, it's pretty uncommon, this bottom picture of a, a road-killed fisher, um, has a, they can have a cream patch on their chest or um, in their genital area, um, sometimes one or the other, sometimes both, but it's, it's more common for them to not have it. And here's those, those claws I'm talking about, another reason why some people may have referred to them as a cat. Um, they have very long, sharp, retractable claws, uh, just like a cat. Um, and they can rotate their feet almost 180 degrees which is um, one of the reasons that they can just, it's the, the reason why they can, they can climb down a tree head first. And there's not many speed animals that can do that. Most of the time you see a bear go up a tree, bear comes back down backwards. It's because they're able to turn those claws around that they can, they can go down the tree head first. They are excellent, excellent climbers, fully at, at home, up in the canopy of trees, chasing squirrels, um, chasing house cats, and I'll get into that a little bit later as well. Their tracks are pretty distinct. You can see the five toes um, and the, the unique uh, heel pad, but the, the pattern on the left in the snow, and I'm pointing at things, and I know you can't see me pointing, but the pattern of the thing, uh, the tracks in the snow is, is the classic um, weasel pattern where, the, you know, they're kind of, they lope along um, in that weasel sort of way. So that's, that's what their tracks look like. If you're ever out, you'll see them in the snow or in, in the mud sometimes. They have a, an interesting skull. Um, fishers have a very strong bite, so they have a very strong um, bite muscle, the temporalis muscle. And in the males, the skull um, on the below, you can see that, that sagittal crest right on the backside, that kind of wing that sticks up. And that indicates a strong bite. Um, so that is the point of connection for that temporalis muscle. Females, it's much less prominent, but they, you still wouldn't want to get bit by one of them either. So um, The males reach sexual maturity around uh, one to two years, probably two years is more common, but if they have the resources and they're in great condition, they might reach it in a year. Females are going to reach sexual maturity at a year um, and then have their first litter at two years of age. They only have, you know, give birth to one litter a year, and it's typically, they're giving birth in late February, early March. Um, kind of interesting thing about Fisher is that they have delayed implantation. Um, that's basically when the egg is fertilized, it doesn't uh, implant or, or um, attach and, and continue development for about 10 to 11 months um, from when, they're at, when it's actually fertilized. Um, so they basically, the females are essentially pregnant or lactating or in some way raising young their entire adult life. So right after they give birth, um, basically a week after they give birth, they go back into estrus or heat and are mated at that point. And then that fertilized embryo sits in their, um, in their uterus for 10 to 11 months before implanting. Uh, and then basically 30, I think it's like 31 days um, gestation period and they're having young and starting the process all over again. The little kits are um, born again in February, and March. They can have litters up to as many as six, but you know, I think two or three is probably the most common. Um, and that's, that's 
a, a litter of kits inside of a tree den. And I had the um, pleasure, I don't know, it was probably six, seven years ago, somebody cut down a tree and they called us because there was a, a fisher um, family in there. So I got to go, because the mother was obviously gone and abandoned them at that point. And I got to go pick up the kits and they were the cutest little things that, you know, I don't, I don't uh, like to tell people to have, you know, cause it's illegal to have um, wildlife as pets. But when you have one of those things in your hand, it sure does, it sure does make you want to keep it because they are so cute, but you know what they're going to grow into and you don't want one of them as a pet anyways. Um, they're born with very little fur and blind about 40 grams and they develop pretty quickly. Their eyes will open at about 53 days. They can crawl around um, fairly well at about three weeks and then three months old, they're climbing, they're active, they're out and about with the, with the mother. Um, the mother is the one that is solely responsible for raising young. So uh, the dad fishers are kind of deadbeats. They basically show up to, to breed and then go off on their own and, and live their solitary life again. The kits are typically young, uh, born in trees. Um, they'll, you know, that tree on the left in this picture is a perfect example of a, um, a den tree that would be used by fisher, owls, raccoons, any number of species that use these snags or cavities in trees. Um, and that's where they'll, they'll raise their young um, for the first few weeks of their life anyways. Uh, once the young are, are active and mobile and able to climb, again, about three, three months, uh, they'll tend to move them down to a ground den. And the, the purpose for that is I think they, do, they have them up in the trees and that's to avoid ground predators. So there aren't many things that are gonna eat a fisher, especially an adult fisher, but the young are susceptible to a number of different predators, whether it be um, coyote, fox, owl, um, hawk, raccoon, anything like that. Come across a young uh, kit fisher, they will, um, kill them. So I think they go up in the trees for those first three months until the, the young are strong enough to move around and safe to be able to evade ground predators. They're weaned at around eight to 10 weeks. Um, and then at that four month period, they're really starting to um, act like almost an adult fisher. They're hunting. Um, they are going out and hunting with the mother and learning from the mother. And they're basically the same size as her at about five months. So I said the the females reach their full size about five, five and a half months. And so the females could be the same, the females and the males would be the same size as the mother at that point. And they can disperse at that point. Typically it's a little bit longer. Um, they'll stick around a little bit longer into the fall. Um, and then they'll disperse off in search of their own territory, own home range to defend and live their essentially solitary life there. They are solitary animals. Um, I mentioned quickly that they have very relatively few predators. Um, survival rates are very high once they reach adult um, age levels. Um, the young can be predated by coyotes, foxes, hawks, owls, bobcats, um, where we do have bobcats and other species. But again, it's, it's really mostly the young. The adults um, will lose their life primarily to either old age, um, limited amount of regulated trapping or vehicle collisions. Um, they rarely are going to lose um, or uh, lose their life to a fight or anything like that. And then your random disease, um, accidents, things like that. But they tend to have high survival rates and they can live as many as 10 years. Um, when I mentioned that they're ferret on steroids, that's basically what they are. They're very agile, um, very adept predators. They can they can bounce in and out side to side, climb very well. So they're, they're very formidable um, predators of, of small and medium sized game. But they are very shy and elusive. Now we are finding that people are seeing them more in suburban areas um, because they're out and about. Uh, and that's primarily because they're probably finding food at different times of the day. But they are again, proving to be more adaptable. So um, what we once thought is something you virtually could go through your life never even seeing one. People are seeing them more commonly now um, out in, in a variety of habitats. They are solitary animals. The only time they're really gonna be together is the mother with her young when she's raising them or the short period of time 
when they're together, males and females are together to breed. Um, they will, the males will occasionally bump into each other uh, and fight, defend their territories, but they do more of their, de their territory defense through scent marking. Um, their typical hunting, although they will go after squirrels up in the treetops and chase them down, um, their typical hunting is, is to move on the ground. And uh, I think I'll get into their, their hunting behavior a little bit um, later. Uh, there's some aggression among males, um, although again, they're not very um, interactive animals. They don't, um, they're solitary, so there's not much interaction between them. But there can be aggression among males if they hit up against each other at a territorial boundary, or particularly when it's mating season. And if there's a female in the area and the two males happen to be in the area, that's when you could probably have the most aggression. Throughout their habitats, they use, utilize a, a wide range of resting sites. So um, in the evenings or during the day when they're resting, they, they could be in ground burrows under blown down trees, tree, um, tree or shrub piles, um, down in abandoned burrows from anything from woodchuck, fox, coyote. They'll make use of any uh, ground burrows that they can find and they will dig their own. And then they'll also use these tree cavities. They'll use nests in trees. So if you ever look up in a tree and you see you know, squirrel nest, just a big clump of leaves or a raccoon nest up in a tree, um, they'll use both of those. They'll go into squirrel nests and use those to rest during the day too. In the winter time when it's cold, um, they'll, they're much more likely to use ground burrows or even snow dens, uh, caverns that they dig down underneath the snow, um, just because it, they get more warmth down there. And in the spring through fall, they're most likely to be up in tree nests when they're resting. <clears throat> Um, habitat sizes vary considerably, and as with most wildlife species, the habitat size is almost certainly tied to the resources in those habitats. So um, areas where they have more resources or more densely packed resources, animals are going to have smaller home ranges, vice versa. When there's less resources, they have to have larger home ranges. And we see that gradient between suburban and rural areas because in suburban or even more urban areas, there's a much higher density of food resources available to a lot of these species, whether it be rodents, you know, mat, uh, rats, mice, rabbits, squirrels, chipmunks, any of those type of species that tend to be more abundant in suburban areas, but also the foods that those species eat, bird seed, compost, trash, um, other sorts of human provided foods all provide more and more resources in suburban areas, so we see less um, need to have bigger home ranges. Home ranges can vary anywhere from two to 10 square miles for Fisher. Average is gonna be three to five, and again, you're gonna see the lower range when there's higher food resources or more suburban areas, and then out in rural parts of the state, Western Mass, where they have to move around more to get the resources they need, you'll see home ranges up to 10 square miles or more. Uh, male home ranges are much larger than the females, and they will tend to overlap several females' home ranges, and that's really just the nature of the, the animal um, overlapping to provide breeding opportunities. Fishers have excellent senses of smell, hearing, and sight, um, which again makes them such a good predator. And they, as I mentioned earlier, they, they do most of their interaction once they reach their adult life, uh, aside from breeding or the female raising young through scent marking. So they have glands on their abdomen and on their hind feet. Uh, they have an anal sac that has glands uh, scent in it, and then just their urine and feces alone. So they'll, they'll drag their abdomen um, through their urine and their feces, and then just their walking around and moving around the habitat alone is spreading their calling card that this is my territory, don't come in it, or um, for the males finding the females, that's how they can communicate. One of the biggest myths when it comes to fishers is that they're noisy, they make a ton of noise, they sound like a woman screaming or somebody getting murdered. Um, all of those rumors that are out there are completely um, not based in reality when it comes to fisher biology. And all of the leading scientists who have studied them in the 
both in the wild and in captivity. They're not a very vocal animal at all. Um, I did have sounds here that I was gonna play and I think I can get them up um, on my phone and hopefully you'll be able to hear it. These are the two most common things that people um, hear in their back, you know, backwoods at night um, that sounds like something that, they, uh, that they'll say is a fisher. So I'll try and play the first one. Okay, that's one. And the other one is Okay, I don't know if anybody could hear those or not, but the first one was a red fox. So that's a red fox um, scream. Uh, they do it very regularly, you hear it all the time. That's, that's probably the number one thing that people attest to being fishers. And then the second one was raccoons fighting. And if you've ever heard raccoons in the trees close to your house or even in your yard fighting, it sounds horrible. It sounds like, you know, limbs are getting torn off. It's a terrible sounding thing coming from the woods. Fishers, they can vocalize. They very, very rarely vocalize, and it's usually um, only, you know, the mother interacting with the kits or, you know, the rare circumstance when the males and females get together or there's an interaction between two males. But it's very, very uncommon for them to make any noise. So I know a lot of people like to think they've heard fishers, but in reality, if somebody tells you they've heard a fisher, they've almost certainly heard another more common wildlife species. Um, so foods, uh, what our fishers eat, they are, again, similar to many of our um, suburban species, an opportunistic omnivore, which basically means if they can catch it or get it, they'll eat it. Um, and if it gives them the resources that they need. I've mentioned several times they're an exceptional predator. Um, they tend to hunt in a zigzag pattern on the ground. Um, and they'll basically just zigzag through um, likely prey habitat, hoping to flush, um, you know, whatever it is, a, a rabbit or whatever. Once they flush it, they chase it down and attack it. Um, most of their prey are herbivores, rodents, squirrels, shrews, um, rabbits, but they will also take birds, um, both actual baby birds, bird eggs, um, turkey poults, adult turkeys, anything they can catch. If They'll try and catch anything, um, but if they can catch it, they're gonna, it's going to be part of the, the prey um, or part of their uh, dinner possibilities. They rarely eat fish, although they will occasionally eat them or scavenge on them. And occasionally they've even been known to eat other carnivores. So uh, raccoon, um, small fox, and they've even been documented to kill and um, prey on lynx up in Maine, which is a larger species that you think that they would want nothing to do with, but that tells you how formidable they are. One of the coolest things about fishers is they're actually um, one of the only species and certainly the only one in New England that can effectively prey on porcupines. And again, that's because of their, you know, their ferret, ferret-like abilities to dart in and out so what they do with a porcupine is they get it facing it head on and then they'll dart in and out and just bite it on the face quick, bite it on the face quick and keep doing that until the porcupine is either weakened or um, to the point where they can roll it over and attack its uh, unprotected belly or it's blind and they can roll it over. And I know it sounds gruesome, but it is uh, one of the things that they're able to do. And they're actually important in, in a number of forested habitats and that is when porcupines can get um, at high levels, they can actually do quite a bit of damage to trees and certain forest types. Uh, so fisher are able to control the porcupine population. Other foods, uh, they, they will eat uh, hard and soft mass, so berries, apples, um, some nuts. They'll eat birds, eggs, and young, insects, grubs, other invertebrates. Um, like I said, if they can get it, they'll eat it. 
carrion, so dead animals, they'll scavenge dead animals without a problem. Domestic fowl, so that's one of the ways that humans and, and fisher can kind of come into conflict is they will readily prey on unprotected or poorly protected chickens, ducks, um, and the like. And then like, one of the biggest things um, that they can take out of, out of the wild is domestic cats. Um, most uh, predator species, you know, a, a pretty weary cat can avoid because they can climb so well. They can't avoid fishers because fishers can climb 100 times better than cats and chase them up and down the tree. So um, unfortunately, the sad little uh, puss in boots in the lower right hand corner is, is falls prey to fishers quite often. <clears throat> fishers play an important ecological role. Um, as a mesocarnivore, I mentioned that they can control porcupine populations, but they're also, they're part of the food web and part of uh, the, the trophic cascade um, in the ecosystem. And the picture here of Jenga is one of the examples I like to use when I'm talking about the environment and how important different species are. So if you're familiar with the game Jenga, you know, just picture each one of those, each one of those parts as a species. So you might be able to lose one here or there um, and, and the whole thing doesn't fall down. But if you lose the wrong one or the wrong combination of species, uh, the whole environment or the whole ecosystem can be affected. So fish are an important animal in this ecosystem. Um, <clears throat> They're also a very important um, economic species, historically more so than today, but um, pelt prices do range significantly depending on demands from different industries across the, the country and the world. But so we do have a regulated trapping season. Um, and we've, we've set that, like I said, about three weeks in November. And that's based on when the, the fisher pelts, the, the fur of the fisher, is in a condition that's known as prime. So that's um, when the coat is at its best um, condition, densest fur, nicest fur, so it, it's more marketable. Um, and historically, fisher pelts can range anywhere from $20 to $50. Um, this says the high can get over $80, but not too many years ago, um, there was a huge demand for, for certain types of fur and fisher pelts were worth upwards of $150 each for for a good pelt. They're used in a variety of, of ways, um, clothing, um, trim, scarves, and, and a number of uh, other um, clothing types. Uh, I mentioned they can prey. They're, the economic role or the way that they can interact economically with people in a negative way is they can predate livestock and pets. So how do we live with fishers? Um, it's pretty easy if we take the most common sense um, simple approaches to, to avoiding conflicts with any wildlife. So I know people really enjoy to, to feed the birds and uh, other wildlife, but you have to realize that that does come with um, some other effects. So you're drawing species to your yard, small mammals, um, birds. So you're drawing things to your yard that are prey for other species. So then you're inadvertently drawing um, prey species, whether it be fisher, coyote, hawks or owls to your yard as well. So that's something that that's occurring. So if you want to avoid having conflicts with fishers in your yard and, and other wildlife species, you should remove food attractants from your yard, whether it's bird seed, improperly stored trash, compost that's not protected, what have you, you're drawing species to your yard and sometimes that can have negative effects. If you are going to feed the birds, um, the most effective way to do it to avoid conflicts is to have bird feeders with those big trays underneath to limit as much of the, the bird seed from getting onto the ground as possible. So make sure that it's mostly birds getting it and then you're not drawing in as many small mammals and other, other things to your yard. In terms of living with fisher and, and, and protecting your pets, it's simple, just pro practice proper pet husbandry. So that means with cats, if you care about them, keep them inside. An outdoor cat immediately becomes part of the food chain and they are not the top of the food chain. So when you let them outside, they're at great risk of being preyed on by something else. Never mind the fact that outdoor cats also prey on a huge number of small mammals and songbirds every year. 
and they actually have a negative impact on those populations. So um, if you wanna have your cat outside, a lot of people have built these pens and things like that where you can let them outside, but letting an outdoor cat out, um, it is very likely to fall prey to fishers and other species. And then with the biggest thing we see with fisher is they are great at getting into poorly constructed or poorly protected chicken coops. Um, chicken wire is not enough for fisher or most other species. Um, they can tear right through it. Uh, so if you, if you have backyard chickens or ducks, if you free range them, it is what it is. They're part of the, the food web and if they get taken, that's, that's just the cost of doing business. If they are in an enclosed run, then you should have much heavier duty uh, gauge wire than just chicken wire. Bury it into the ground and have it come out at a 90 degree angle so nothing can dig down um, under the bottom of the fencing either. And if you do that, I mean, if, you're, if your coop is secure enough and your run secure enough, you can prevent fisher and, and pretty much any other species other than perhaps a bear, which we are going to have in southeastern mass before too long uh, again. So. Um, with that, I'll, uh, you know, I'll wrap up the end of the talk here. I've gone a little longer than I expected, but um, <clears throat> hopefully I've dispelled some of the myths like with Fisher in terms of them being massively aggressive, something to really be worried about. You should, you should pretty much be happy if you get to see one. Um, they're a really cool animal and not many people do get to see them. I've spent, uh, I'm sure, much more time in the woods than than the vast majority of people over the course of my life, and I've only seen a handful of fishers in the wild. Um, so you're lucky if you get to see one. And then in terms of their, their, their vocalizations, um, more likely than not, people are hearing other species, even though we do have fisher in our, um, all of our neighborhoods. And then finally, I'd like to thank everyone for um, taking the time to, to listen to the talk. You obviously um, care about and are in, interested in wildlife, and if you're connected to the 300 committee in some way that also tells that you care about, um, you know, the environment and protecting habitats for people and for wildlife. Um, so I thank you for, for being involved in that. And I thank um, the 300 committee for allowing me to give the talk and inviting me to do so. so thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Jason. And thanks to everybody for coming. Does it, anybody have a question? There looks like there are a couple of questions that we can go through. Um, the chat, uh, very informative, thank you. Um, oops, okay, I guess, any other questions? You answered them all, Jason, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate your being here. Thanks, thanks again, and thanks to all of you for coming um, and sharing this time with us. Do keep an eye on your inboxes. We'll be informing you of some upcoming, some more upcoming talks and some small, group hikes. Um, please get out and enjoy the beautiful trails in Falmouth. Um, stay well, stay positive, and thanks again for coming. Good night. Thank everybody. you. Thank you. That was great. Thanks a lot. <laughs>